Yes, good morning and assalamu alaikum to all of you, the lovely lady, pretty ladies who are here. Your discussion have been, uh, informal session of discussion was very engaging indeed. So we are here today, this morning, to, uh, to watch the screening of uh, Jennifer Hall Lee's uh, groundbreaking film, I must say, a documentary film on feminist stories from the women's liberation movement. Uh, yesterday I was also talking somewhere, I said that uh, uh, as a woman, you see, there has to be done more than talking. And one of the important thing which is more than talking is documenting the stories, documenting the history, which is very important. We cannot take the issues to the road and to the public spaces if we are not grounded in that history which have helped us to be where we are today. You see, the women who participated in 1960s movement, feminist movement, they are the women who have actually paved this road for us. And we carry their legacy. So you will see in this documentary, Jennifer traveling all over to record the interviews of those women who participated in that uh, movement. So now let's watch the film again together. Thank you. So here we are. So the, our question and answer session starts. So uh, I would request, as I already requested, that uh, please try to be brief in your comment and question so that she has more time to explain it. Okay? So over to you and Jennifer. Anyone who would like to ask the question? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Fawzia Rana, I'm a journalist. I was to ask how long it took to make this documentary because there were so many people and so much work and then there were footage and so engaging. So it's not an easy task. So how much time they made it? How many people made it? It's a lot of work. So tell us about it. Thank you. Her question is that uh, as she watched this movie, she felt that it must have taken a lot of time and a lot of effort. So she wants to know the process of making this documentary, the time, effort, resources, etc. It took about 10 years. And that's not unusual. Documentaries can often take five, six, seven years, 10 years. I've seen some people spend 20 years. And it's because in a documentary film, the story kind of emerges as you're shooting. It, it's not really planned out. And what I realized is that I had all of these little vignettes of stories. And I had to figure out how to sew them together. So it took a lot of time to bring my honest voice out. That always takes a while. It's harder to do than it sounds. I also started this film before, was I married? I might have been, I, it may have been before I was married. It was definitely before I became a parent. So my daughter is in this and she would come to all the interviews with us. And so she's met so many of these women. So when she asks me questions about the women's liberation movement, I say, well, you know, you met a lot of these women. And that was really important for me because when I was growing up, these women were making all of this happen. And so we were just immersed in this world of women's liberation. And when I look at younger generations, I see that they've really missed something. So it was important for me to make this film to show all of this. When I first made the film, somebody from NYU said, I'm really glad you're making this because when I want to show a film on the, women's, uh, on, um, the civil rights movement, I have about 200 films to choose from. But when it comes to the women's liberation movement, I only have a few. And there's a lot of reasons for that that I've kind of ascertained over the years. But women's history is not something that moves through our society comfortably. And that's one of the reasons we don't have a lot of this history in curriculum. It's not even really in our public school curriculum. Uh, I just, uh, uh, it was an amazing journey. And uh, I think that we are all thankful uh, to the sisters who really made uh, us feminists and, uh, and helped us achieving so much 
in countries like ours. But I've, I'm just thinking that there are struggles of women right here in all part of the world. Are you documenting all those uh, stories or not? And how long that will take? Right now, I'm finishing a different film about women and the environment. So ecofeminism was a big part of the women's liberation movement. And it's something that I think is really timely right now, given climate issues and the history of women and uh, the environment, which is another thing that hasn't been documented. So I'm really zeroed in on that. And I think it would probably take a large team of filmmakers to document uh, the women's issues globally, which definitely needs to happen. I don't have a question per se. It's uh, just a comment and uh, a lot of appreciation for doing this work. There were, there were some glimpses of street theater done by women. Me being part of street theater for a long time, I know how difficult it is to go on streets, and I think it's commendable. Um, in today's time also, I, I think street theater holds uh, a lot of strength to change the mindset of people because it moves you. And being part of it myself, I know it's highly dangerous. Um, in subcontinent, in, in, in countries like Pakistan, uh, we are uh, subjected to a lot of hatred, sometimes violence, because I've suffered in that time frame also. My only question was that have you interviewed women who were part of that theater and what difficulties were they facing? Because over here we face a lot of difficulties. What difficulties were they subject to and how effective was street theater there and then? From what I heard, the street theater then went off very well. They got some harassment, as you can see in the Miss America pageant protest. I didn't interview specific, a lot of them. It was hard to find these women in a sense. I mean, one woman led me to another, to another, to another. But it, it wasn't like I knew off the top of my head who these women were. I had to look through the books. I had to read the history. And as an independent filmmaker, I went where these women led me. So there, I did, there were a few at that Miss America pageant. Kathy Sarah Child, who was the funeral of traditional womanhood, they got a lot of pushback on that. But at, from my, my opinion on it is it didn't last very long. There was that initial pushback, and then people kind of pulled in the information. They were pelted with some things once in a while, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer, for giving us this opportunity to watch this movie. Uh, well, I would like to ask a very personal question, if you're comfortable with this. While documenting this uh, throughout this uh, movie, uh, what do you think how uh, yourself has been changed with reference to the gender lens? What do you think that with reference to the feminism that you have been evolved, the ideology that has not been, you know, that being considered by you the before uh, going through these stories and, you know, documenting these things in a, such a proper way? How have I been changed? Yes. Yeah. By this. Yeah, your growth, your journey, maybe. Uh, yes. While you see, it took you ten years. So the process, how much impact it had mm. on you? Tremendous. How much do you think that you have changed? Tremendous, because I was working in the film industry while I started this film. By the time I had ended the film and completed it, I wasn't interested in working in the film industry anymore. I wanted to do other things. And I think I saw a very, I think I was in a very corporate male environment. And I think I felt it really deeply. And yeah, and, and that, that question, it's always being revealed to me as I go through. And I think it goes back to starting this film and listening to these stories and listening to these women talk. It's really important to hear those stories personally. That's incredibly powerful 
that I think people forget. Because after that woman whispered the word feminist and I was at work, I couldn't think of anything to tell her. And I was frustrated. So I called my mother and I said, what was it like before the women's liberation movement? And she said, well, I remember having to look for work in the female help wanted section of the newspaper. And when I heard her say that, I had this vague recollection of hearing about that. And then I said to myself, that shouldn't be a vague recollection. That is a big part of our history because I was born when that was all going on. In fact, when it was overturned, when the um, Supreme Court overturned that, I think I was in middle school. So all those feelings and attitudes towards women were present in my life growing up. And I had to unravel all that. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Um, I was just having a question in mind that in any kind of activism, we usually hear the theory that initially the activism is usually reactive and then it um, evolves into a proactive activism. When I look at the feminism in US, I feel as if it is now in the proactive phase. Um, please comment upon that, if my perception is correct or not, because in Pakistan, definitely, we are still in reactive phase. Reactive. We he yes, we hear news, uh, we get reports of women violence, violence against women, and we hear stories and narratives against women education and all that, and then we become active. So this is a kind of reactive activism. But I feel as if US has now entered a proactive phase. What's your comment on that? That's interesting. I've never really thought about it in those words, Proact reactive, proactive. But now that I think about it, since we're getting such incredible backlash, and we're definitely having a problem with authoritarianism, and that's shocking a lot of people. But the reaction against women's rights and Roe versus Wade, definitely women are very proactive. I mean, there are, there are women in Texas suing the state right now. And you look at that, I look at that, and I'm very hopeful. It was shocking when all of that was overturned and we're, there, there's more things happening, but you really kind of see it with this historic lens. And it just, it's sort of like, this is really strange, this is happening. It's like we're in this strange spot. But with the women being so proactive in, in pushing back on this very successfully also, o Ohio just fought back very strongly when the legislature was trying to um, make abortion, illegal, do an abortion ban, and they fought back so successfully, it gives me great hope. So I'm actually really hopeful right now in this strange way. So yeah, I'd agree, I, and that's an interesting way to look at it. I think we are very proactive right now. Maybe we see lots of reaction when something happens in uh, Pakistan in the media. But I would say that feminist resistance is always there. And they have been very proactive on working on real issues that really uh, matter to uh, all the women in Pakistan. Uh, like, uh, for instance, uh, if you look at the uh, Aurat March, that is Women March, that is really organized. It is not funded by anybody. It is indigenous movement that started in 2017. And they are taking all the issues that really matter from body to family to private sphere to the public sphere. So I would say, uh, I would say that, of course, there is a reaction when some rape happens and gang rape happens and, and a child is abused. That is, that, those are the reports that we get from the media. But there is resistance always and there had always been a resistance and we had been always very proactive as well. Yeah. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes. I'm Shireen Geba, um, an author and... Um, uh, I love filmmaking as a, you know, genre, and I think uh, it's a great uh, piece of work that you have done. Um, but I couldn't help, uh, we have seen 
I think we are all familiar with all that you have documented and uh, it just makes you realize how much work is needed in our country as such. But uh, America's story didn't end where you ended the movie. It has continued to this day. And I think the women over there have really stood up for each aspect of their lives and they have succeeded in many ways, but the struggle is still on. So do you have a plan to make a part B of the same thing, uh, bringing it to up to date, you know, to, to the current times? Uh, okay, so I have, uh, people have asked me that before. So I, I have a lot of footage, you know, I interviewed about 30, 35 women, so I have a lot. And, you know, after you make a film like this, you kind of want to do something else just because you do. <laughs> and, but I, I've thought about that. And the other part of me, though, is like, we still only have a few films on this history. Yes. And it's perplexing me that we don't have more. And I think that's part of the patriarchal society. Why aren't women diving into this? and creating media around this history. It's tremendous history. You know, every single female in the United States of America and men are resting on this history. You know, men didn't even, they weren't expected to even hold babies, change diapers, or push a stroller. You see men doing that all over the place. That's the women's liberation movement. Every woman in the, a university, women's liberation movement. The women, um, um, the gymnast who just won, you know, more awards and the, the soccer player, these women, women's liberation movement yes. yep. over and over and over and over. And you're looking at a society that really has some amnesia around this history. And I think I'm really more interested in why we have that problem <laughs> as opposed to just making another film. Cause I think there, I mean, I'd love it if 20 other filmmakers decided to revisit this history and make another film of what you think. So that is part of our problem is how women see themselves in history and in society. Do they see themselves as important? Do they see themselves as the narrators of their nation? And that, that's a concept I think about. Who's the narrator of the nation? Who's telling the national story to the world? We still have men telling that story. And that's partly what's holding us back. So, uh, um, this makes from, uh, sorry, uh, from our point of view, like we've seen quite a few uh, Muslim women uh, getting into our higher echelons over there and uh, taking over in different, uh, I mean, in different uh, posts in, uh, in legislation and otherwise. And this is, a, again, another very, uh, you know, like you all said, uh, it was said that there shouldn't be any, uh, you know, differentiation for gender or religion or this thing, and then you see it being done. So I think it's uh, hats off to all the efforts that have been made so far, but I'm also very much interested in what's going on today uh, among the women of US. And frankly, it's a great way for us to learn how much we have to fight in so many uh, shapes and forms. Like here, there at least you have a legal system to go to. Here, we do not have it, I'm sorry to say. So that is our biggest handicap over here. So it's a very eye-opening uh, video on you. It's a beautiful work. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So legislation was a big part of the women's liberation movement. Everything they were pushing for, they had specific demands. And if you look back, those demands were all met with legislation. Uh, with reference to her first question, mm. it reminded me you talk about uh, uh, who is behind the camera. Mm. While you were, you see, searching the archives, the films and the videos and the press coverage of that time, and the footage or the clips you found or the news you found. So what was your assessment of that? Who were the people who captured those moments and how did they capture? Was there man's eye behind the camera? You see, yes. just, just uh, I would like you to say something about this. When I was interviewing these women, I would always say, so do you have any photos? Have any photo albums? Where's your scrapbook? 
And they'd say a lot, of, the majority of them would say, well, we were really kind of bad about taking pictures. We just didn't. And I thought, okay. So I had to really dive into these archives and find them. And I would go to ABC News and uh, NBC and all these and look. And I, you'd see outtakes too. So they'd send me a little clip. This is what we have on this march. And then I'd see all the outtakes and it dawned on me, oh, there's all men behind these cameras because camera men, right? Yeah. There's a reason for that. And I thought, that's interesting. You didn't have the women's perspective on this. And they only had like one or two female journalists that the company would send out, like, and they would call it a woman's parade, not a march. The women are having a parade. And they'd send the up and coming female journalist, right? Whereas all the other women were stuck being secretaries. And uh, they'd send her out. That's why you saw the female reporter in the Miss America pageant protest. And she had the <laughs> mic and she was laughing with them. So they were very few and far between. And then, so you had to rely on images shot by men. Yeah. And every time you get behind a camera, you're aiming that camera. So you're making a decision as to what you're shooting. And we all want to be neutral as a documentary filmmaker. You know, we, we want to always do the right thing. But we're still human beings. You're going to shoot what you're going to shoot. And yet we had a time when men were just shooting every single image. So you, could, you didn't get that female voice out there so that power of the narrator is really important to me, and I still see it now in, in the United States. Who's telling all of these stories? And we seem to fall into this patriarchal perspective. I don't think women have really gotten to this place where their, their voice is actually front and center. I'm going to narrate this. And what is this? Is it our country? I think it should be. We've never had a female narrating the United States of America. It's always been that male perspective from George Washington and that cherry tree um, to the statues of men at war. And that's a big history of maleness that we have to push through to get our voices out. And we're still in that. And I don't think we've even given that a name, whereas Betty Friedan and her brilliance gave it that name. And, you know, I think it was Ruth Rosen who said that's one of the great achievements of the women's movement was naming the problem. You really have to have the ability to name. And men have always taken that ability to name. Brief point to make because, of course, it is global and uh, uh, there is no hard story. And if the hard story is written, it is written by him. So that uh, goes all around the world. So uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, things are happening here. And I hope that uh, you, because you are interested in things, and uh, there are veteran uh, feminists from the early uh, feminist movement in Pakistan. There are the uh, you know, uh, women uh, uh, activists uh, from the 90s and 70s to 90s and to uh, and the recent uh, young people, you can always take a step and make that movie. And that is going to be a very beautiful story. So I did have one thing to say on, on the history. So when my daughter was in fourth grade and I was making this film, I flipped through her California history book because several of the women in this film live in California. You know, Eileen Hernandez was San Francisco. Uh, and so I thought, let me look up women's liberation in the index of this uh, book, knowing it wouldn't be in there, but I'm going to give it a shot. And I looked, it's not in there. So I had to flip through the book. Where would it be? Where would it be? So I found the section where it would normally be. And there was something on Cesar Chavez, who's, you know, the immigrant, um, you know, activist, but his partner was Dolores Huerta. And it was almost as if she was his assistant, the way it was written. But she was his partner, equal. Then there was another section, because it was about the civil rights movement, the labor movement in California. Then there was another section that said, women also fought for their rights. No mention of women's liberation. 
And they mentioned our great senator who just died, Dianne Feinstein. They did mention her. But Dianne Feinstein wasn't really a second wave feminist. I mean, really, Eileen Hernandez should have been in there. Vivian Rothstein, you know, they really should have had these women. But they're not as well known. And then at the bottom, it said, things the students should remember, things you should remember. And it had a timeline that went through the 60s and the 70s. Not one woman's on the timeline. This is my daughter's fourth grade book. So that's when I started getting really interested in curriculum and teaching this. So, but we're still moving through that. It's really still not there, which is shocking because we just had Roe versus Wade overturned. And when it was overturned, I watched all the news coverage and read, and I thought, they're missing something here. This Roe versus Wade was decided at the height of the women's movement, but it was never talked about that way in news coverage. It wasn't coupled like that. It, it sort of, Ro, the history of Roe Ro versus Wade when it was overturned sort of like hovered out there with no foundation. And I kind of just marveled at this phenomenon happening. And that's because we're disconnected from women's liberation movement history in the United States. Okay, Jennifer, so um, being an academic, and as I told you, my research is on feminist pedagogical approach. Um, one thing that has always troubled me is, whether it's the US or Pakistan, the very word feminism. When I was reading this very um, remarkable book by uh, Bell Hooks, uh, which is called Feminism is for Everybody. Mm -hmm. And as you said, I mean, you, you still have the backlash of the US despite all the efforts that these women have had. And if you read the history, somehow it was said that there were those white, elitist, you know, privileged women who were talking about women's rights. And then, of course, there was black women coming in and joining hands. And then, of course, uh, you know, feminism in the U.S. has come a long way, as Dr. Afsha was saying. However, we still have the backlash, even in the U.S., when it comes to the word feminism. And, you know, when you talk about our context, I mean, we have the history, particularly um, after Zia's Zudud ordinance, our women were very active in 1980s. And then this Aurat March has revived the word itself because I think they've done a tremendous job in at least reviving the spirit of feminism. But still, you know, it still remains this very tabooed word. And I personally feel that are we missing out something when it comes to the word? Have we not been able to explain it to everyone what it is? Because when I was doing my research, um, you know, uh, for the PhD class, I, I had to lecture young girls about what feminism is, and it is for everybody, and, you know, what does it actually mean? So do you think, as a documentary maker, that we need to, you know, break those misconceptions about what it is and what it is meant to do, so that perhaps it is more inclusive and includes every kind of women and does not remain you know, that tabooed word, which is a Western agenda that elitist, privileged women are trying to impose on the population. So what's the question? <laughs> how, can, how can we make feminism more acceptable in the U.S. and the rest of the world? In the last 10 years, it has become more acceptable. And it was partly because of the presidency of Trump. There was a, a backlash on that. It was a pushback. So we've gotten some space there. However, feminism is a threat to patriarchy. And anything that threatens patriarchy is going to have with it a backlash that's going to include both women and men. So it's a tough nut to crack. However... I believe it can be. And it's going to take a lot of women working together to do it. But patriarchy is insidious. It moves and changes as women gain rights. So the patriarchy will say, all right, so you want to be a congressperson. Well, okay, well, we'll let, the, we'll let them in. But not half. We'll, we'll take a quarter, you know. You want to be president? Well, no, we're not ready for that. But OK, we'll do a vice president. Yeah. And we'll keep doing that until you get really mad. Yeah. <laughs> and we kind of have to keep pushing through this. And there's an example I use, because it's a little bit of an issue for me. 
Back in the 60s, we used the word mankind to, to talk about all people. Yeah. Mankind, mankind, man. We're all man. She mentioned it in the film. And feminists said, it's not going to work. If we are humankind. We are humans. You're not going to leave us out. Mm -hmm. So we changed it. And successfully, the society said, humankind. We're going to do yes. humankind. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, everybody's called guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everybody. It's like, I hear it 10 times a day. And what that's doing is saying guy is the main frame. It's the neutral. It's the anchor up upon which humankind rests. Mm -hmm. So if we're all guys, let's just get rid of the word woman. Let's get rid of the word girl. What's the point of even having it? Because you're just a subset now. So it's keeping that subset in place. So there's very simple things you, do, you can do, but you've got to keep pushing back. Every time I hear the word guy, I always say, I'm not a guy. <laughs> and then people just stop and go, well, uh, well, well, I don't know what else to say. People, friend, y'all, everybody. I mean, there's really a lot of words out there <laughs> that you can pick from, but the resistance is incredible. Yes. And that resistance is the patriarchy maintaining itself. Yeah. And it's designed to wear you out. Yeah. So you have to keep fighting through these things. And it may seem that the word guy is small. Why are you worrying about a, a word? It's just a word. No. The words are in our heads because they're there for a reason that motivate us and make us see things a certain way. So what's in your head comes out of your mouth. And that's how you move through the world. So I always say, well, you know, I'm not a guy. Let's just call everybody a gal. Hey, gals. And see how women yes. feel. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just start doing it because I don't have a problem doing that. But at first I thought, oh, well, they'll just laugh about it because, you know, women can't be the mainframe. Women can't be the anchor. Women can't be that neutral figure. Yeah. A woman is not humankind. Well, why not? Anyway, that's that. Uh, Jennifer, first of all, my deep appreciation to you for your uh, remarkable documentary. Uh, it's a testament to the resilience and strength of women throughout uh, history. I think. It is essential to acknowledge that feminism is not just a uh, women's issue, it's a human issue. And uh, we all should continue to support and empower each other uh, in the pursuit of gender equality. And we shall move toward a more uh, equitable, more just, more compassionate, fairer, and a better world to live in. Um, so. Just congratulations again for your wonderful work, and thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. So, you have a question, actually. Uh, we okay. Let's have this question. The yes. Last question. Okay. He gave me some strength to speak. <laughs> Well, it was uh, excellent work, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I was just thinking that while doing all this, you made a lot of effort to access, to meet all these women and listen to their stories. So you must have a lot more footage mm -hmm. than you can see here. Mm -hmm. In fact, meeting every woman has, its, has her own story. And this is social media time. And wouldn't it be great if each woman, each story, all the footage is made a separate documentary, I mean, available for, for the people to see? You do mean, you have plans regarding that? Uh, no, I don't. I, was going, um, I do plan on archiving the images. And uh, there are many libraries around that could use it. But I don't think I would put something like that on social media. Be yeah, I, I, I would probably put them into a library or an archive for people to access them. That's probably what I would do. Excuse me, uh, would you? Okay. Did you have? <laughs>
uh, speaking of social media, I'm very much uh, pro-social media in the mm. sense that it is extremely powerful and so easily accessible to all. So, um, like this film, would it be available on YouTube? No, I have a distributor who distributes it to colleges and universities. So that is how you get the film. So no, there, there's, um, I mean, a couple of trailers out there, but no, it's not out there for free because I do make some money off of this. I, <laughs> I have to make money. We all have to make a living. So I do make money and um, I'm not on social media. <laughs> because it's really hurting a lot of us. Um, it's made, uh, as far as what I know in my country, it's made people, it, it's, I can't say it's made people. It's a way of speaking with one another that I believe is hurting our discourse and civil society. It has hurt our elections with fake news. Yeah. And if we lose our democracy, we've lost almost everything. And so I don't want to be a part of that. And I am totally fine being off of it. It's actually fantastic. I have more time to read, find primary sources. I have more time to think. Yes. I don't scroll endlessly for nothing. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much. This session is, is so interesting that I just want to let it go and go. But we, have, we don't have time. We people are here with us. I know they are very busy people. They have just a spare time to be with us. But uh, uh, the last thing which she said about social media, we, we had a lot talk about feminism, marches, and the documentary. Uh, we need to discuss that documentary and the women issues. You see, it must be an ongoing conversation. But the last thing which she said about social media, one thing actually really struck me here. <laughs> We are losing our democracy because of social media. This is something so different from, or so different from our perception of social media here. Yeah. We think that social media is the voice of people, democracy. You see, but this thing which she said is just opposite to that perception. Yeah. So here is the critical thinking. Let's think about it. Yeah. Social media is really a voice of the people. It's really making us be more democratic or we are losing democracy or the voice of real people. You see, I agree with her. There, in the morning, I was discussing with my colleagues about few comments. And we said that how, instead of making it a voice of people, there are few people who have hijacked the voices. And there are certain dominant discourses. So, but it is a debatable topic. So let's end this session here because there is no closure, no ending to this. We will start thinking more, reflecting more, and dis discussing it more in the coming days. Thank you very much. Before you leave, we would like to have a group photo here. And I would also like to welcome Ms. Hena Abdi. She is the president of uh, National Council of Arts Los Angeles. And she is accompanying Jennifer in this journey. So she is the part of this project. Please welcome her as well. So let's have a group photo. Thank you. <laughs>